the next page, there's, there's more, um, more enterprising looking output that is completely meaningless. We do see an error buried here if you look very closely. Um, fortunately, uh, if you use Maven more than once, you'll know that this error always happens and it doesn't matter and you can just sort of ignore it. Um, finally, we get to the results of what we're trying to do, which is this quasi-human readable format. And you can always tell uh, command line user interface failure by these arbitrary lines of dashes. Because clearly the developer couldn't read what he was outputting, so he had to put these dashes in here to figure out what's going on. Um, in this case, the test failed. So we see build failure right there. Um, okay, you know, this is not very good. Unfortunately, we exited with zero, which on Unix means success. So build failure means success. Uh, this makes this program very difficult to script and to do anything with um, and, and to incorporate into a larger system. Um, the complete opposite of that is Subversion. Uh, Subversion is not my favorite version control system, but it's a pretty awesome command line application. Here is uh, some output where I've got some conflicts of some files. Um, and there's only two here, but you can imagine having like say 20 of them and you've got to go sort this out. Well, I'm way too lazy to copy and paste all that stuff. And since Subversion plays well with others, I can gradually add Unix commands so that I can list out what's in conflict, get rid of those stupid C's, send the entire list of files to VI where I can go fix everything, and then when I'm done, I can say, I've resolved all the conflicts of Subversion, we're good to go. Um, the creators of Subversion didn't sit down and have a meeting about how can we get a list of conflicted files to go to VI and then get back and resolve in one command. Like, they, they didn't do that. They, what they did is they made their application play well with others so they could be used in ways that were not intended without having to jump through a lot of hoops. So, this is all kind of boiling down to the Unix way of interacting. And facts.org has this awesome quote, which I'll read. Um, expect the output of every program to become the input of another as yet unknown program. Don't clutter output with extraneous information, avoid stringently column or binary input formats, and don't insist on interactive input. I think we can see that many of the programs we've looked at kind of violate a lot of these rules. So what this means more specifically is that your input and output of your program should be machine parsable and human readable. So you think of like delimited, you know, comma delimited, tab delimited, something like that. That Maven uh, log file had info in square brackets, which not only are special characters to the shell, but there's two of them. So it just makes it hard to deal with. You want to make things line oriented. Whatever the thing your application does should output other things, and those things should be one thing per line, because it's very easy using Unix tools or a small amount of Ruby code to kind of parse that out and, and deal with it. Uh, and of course, exit codes, as I mentioned before. Everything looked great, you exit zero. If anything went wrong, it exit with non-zero. You can just exit negative one, or if you have 20 different possible error conditions, you can exit with 20 different error codes. It doesn't really matter, but negative one is certainly fine. And then if you need to message the user about errors that happened or debug information or things like that, you use standard error because you can redirect that wherever you want, dev null, some log file or whatever, and the output, whatever it is your application does, would go to standard out. This might seem obvious, but there's so many command line applications that just don't don't do things this way. So here's here, here's a little bit of Ruby code. Um, it's the world's most inflexible grep. If we're only looking for things with foo in the line, we print it out if we find one, we'll keep account of it. Um, we have our debugging here. We helpfully put the standard error so we can ignore it if we want to. And then in our case, uh, not finding foo is an error, so we exit with negative one. Then we exit with zero, everything's good. So you can see that what this thing does, is there's only about three extra lines of code we, get, we had to add here to make it easily interoperable with other, with other programs. So when we're playing well with others, there's the Unix way, what I just described, and the highway, right? There's, there's no other way to do it. Um, well, that's not, that, that may have been true a while ago, but I don't think that's really true now. I think there's what I call the cucumber way, which um, cucumber meaning the, uh, the testing tool, behavior-driven design, development, whatever you want to call it. Um, cucumber is the first app that I recall having a real user experience that didn't irritate me. You know, there's a lot of heavily bearded Unix aficionados who would be horrified to see such colors and bold um, on their command prompt, but um, I think Cucumber did a really good job here. You know, you see all this red, which is kind of hard to make out here, of things that you haven't done yet and things that are broken and, and yellow or things you haven't done yet. And when you make everything right, you see this nice, lovely little bit of green. And it made me so happy the first time I did that. Um, and, and I said, hey, it's possible to have a real actual user experience on the command line. So I think that's totally fine if the situation calls for it. And so basically what that means, you know, we're still having our exit codes. We don't want to mess around with that. And we still want to have a Unixy option. You know, we might say, hey, um, I need to actually put this in cron, and cron doesn't care about bold. 
So can we just have some sort of normal Unix output? That's fine, but the regular output would be colors, bold, italic. Um, and here's a couple Ruby gems that make it really easy. Um, they basically add methods to string that make it incredibly simple to create all of these fancy colors and bold um, on the command line. But I think that you have to really embrace this and take it all the way or not do it. Um, you don't want to just throw a couple bolds in there just because you can or make something red just because you can. You really need to make it a full user experience if that makes sense. And if it doesn't, then, then don't do it. Because really the Unix way is always fine. If you're, if you're not sure what to do, the Unix way is fine. But if you think your application is complicated enough and sophisticated enough to have a real user experience, then, you know, like I said, Ruby gives you some very easy tools to do that. So, right, everything I've said so far, you could probably make some great command line applications in Perl or Python or whatever if you had to. So why, you know, why do we care about Ruby? Well, there's really easy ways to interact with the system, as we've seen already, and you've probably, you've probably known this. Um, system just executes whatever. Uh, backtick executes whatever and gives you the output of that as a string. Um, dollar sign question mark gives you access to the results, so you can say, if dollar sign question mark dot success, uh, then everything's cool. Um, uh, and then, of course, file utils, if you've done any rake stuff, file utils gives you a bunch of methods that look and behave like Unix command line tools, which lets you make uh, system automation scripts that are almost as succinct as Bash, but they will work on any platform. So if you find yourself having to run on Windows, then you totally can. You don't have to worry about SIGWIN, whether or not it's going to work, and what it's going to do with your paths. Um, now, beyond just the ability to run system commands, obviously Ruby is a great language in general. It has all these high-level abstractions, all this object-oriented programming. So presumably, you're working on an application like a web app, or a desktop app, or a mobile app, and it's all using some object-oriented language. Ruby, hopefully, possibly C Sharp or Java. And all of the lessons that you know from object-oriented programming there, you can apply to your Ruby command line scripts. If you're writing them in Bash, you can't. And if you're writing them in Perl, everything's sort of hacked on at the end. So that's, you know, so, so you can apply everything there. Um, packaging distribution gem is very easy. If you need to do something more sophisticated than just check out a version control, um, gem is really easy to use. Um, and it's fast. It's just as fast as Bash to start up and run a script. There's no crazy VM that you have to start up. Uh, if I went back to that Maven output, you'd see running one test took like a minute. Um, so you don't have that. You don't have that issue with Ruby. Um, and finally, the community really um, was built on the command line. I mean, every Ruby gem that you get has uh, command line tools with it. Usually, everything kind of starts on the command line. So it's really part of the kind of ethos of Ruby. And what that means to you is that there's a ton of gems if you can find them, that can do all kinds of cool stuff on the command line. Um, and of course, the, the Ruby culture is to make little gems that do one thing, so you can glue them up together as you need to, which is, which is great. Um, so how do, we, how do we actually do this once we've sort of bought into this? So for a simple application, um, option parser, um, maybe some of you have used that. It's included with Ruby. Um, it's available everywhere, and it's very easy. The rdoc pretty much gives you a great example of how to use it. Um, so here's how we would start it up. We would say, option parser got new, and we give it a block that takes an ops object, and on that object, we'll call some methods that will describe what our command line interface looks like. So we do something like this. We're going to take a, a, a switch called dash dash no auto, and it means no auto regenerate, and then the block that's given will be executed when the user uh, specifies this switch on the command line. So you can do whatever you want in that block. Typically, people just set up some hash that has a list of the options, but you can really do anything you want there. Um, and then this little string here will get used to create a nice help interface that you don't have to worry about formatting. Um, if you need to take an argument, you can use the square bracket syntax, and option parser will parse it out of the command line and give it to you as an argument to your block. Um, and then you can do whatever you want. You can bark if you don't like it. You can set up more things, default, whatever makes sense. <coughs> so option parser is very easy to use. The code that it results in is very easy to understand and pretty clear. Um, and you can even do some type conversions, so you don't have to call 2i on everything. Um, and best of all, it outputs a nice option summary, so you don't have to format anything. You don't have to go into printf or worry about spacing. It takes care of all that for you, which is really nice. Uh, making a command suite style application is a little bit difficult. You can, you can do it, but you have to go through some hoops, and it's not exactly um, straightforward. So trollop is another option to option parser. If you find three lines to set an option too much, you can do it in one line per option here. It's just um, a lot more succinct and brief. Um, you don't have a gem to install, so it's pretty easy to distribute just some file you can include or even just paste into your script if you, if you need to. Um, 
It, it's a little bit easier to do the command suite style applications, um, but it is a, it's still a little bit verbose because it was sort of added later and not, not kind of built in. Um, so if we're doing command suite style applications, where we're going to take a subcommand and have lots of different options, um, we've got a hand jam <coughs> like this. Uh, this is an old version of Show Off, which is the program I'm running right now. Um, and you can see pretty much how this works, right? We're just grabbing the command out of RV and big, big use uh, case statement. Um, of course, this is not super extensible. Um, so you can, if your application needs to grow, become more sophisticated, this hand jamming is just going to start becoming a mess. Or worse, you're just not going to extend your application because it's just too difficult. Um, and the help messages, you've got to hand jam those too. If you add a command, you've got to go find the string that, that lists all the commands and, and add, that, add that there too. Um, this is surprisingly prolific, though. I, I needed to make a command suite application um, way back when, and I looked around and found a lot of this code, and I didn't like that because I'm lazy and I don't have to write all that, and I wanted it to be nice. I wanted it to be a really awesome app. Um, so I created um, a gem of my own called GLI, which stands for Git Like Interface, because that's what makes sense to me. Um, and so it's designed to make uh, command suite style applications like very, very simple. Um, I wanted the application to be super polished, have a really nice health interface, um, without me having to do a whole lot of work. So, like I said, I'm really lazy, but I want it to be nice. Um, so I basically made a, a little scaffolding that sets up some uh, some uh, boilerplate for us. And uh, so we're going to create a command called my command. It's going to take three subcommands called ls, rm, and init. Um, and then when we run what was generated, we can see we've got a nice little help. I mean, obviously the content is just boilerplate, but all this formatting of making the dot, dashes line up and the spacing everything, I don't want to have to deal with it, it's totally done for me, which is pretty nice. Um, when we get help on a particular command, it does, it does this, beautiful, that's exactly what I don't want to have to spend time doing, I want to spend time implementing my application. So here's a little bit of the syntax, um, it is kind of like rake, and that you have, provide this little description, and then you say I've got a switch, and a switch is a uh, a yes or a no type of thing. Um, we can also have a flag, which is a switch that takes an argument. And so we can say there's a default value that we want to have if the user doesn't specify it. Uh, we can describe the name, what the argument like means, and a, and a description. And all this goes into that help, so that when we get help, we can see exactly what we need. And it didn't take us very much code to do it. Um, this, uh, this array lets us say dash f or dash dash file equals. So you can get some flexibility with, with how you, you know, want to want to set up your, your interface. Um, and then here's how we actually de de define a command. Similar in that we say there's a description of what our command serve does. And this is taken from uh, the current version of show off, which is, is using GLI. Um, so again, we get this, uh, this pass to our commands block. And we have all the same methods that we have for the global commands to set up command specific flags and options and, and switches. Um, and then finally, we have an action block. And so this is the block of code that gets called when the user executes your command on the command line. And this block is given the global options that the user specified, including any defaults if they didn't specify things, um, the command specific <coughs> options that the user specified, again, including defaults, um, and then the list of unparsed arguments, anything that was left over after parsing was done. Uh, and then in here, you can do whatever it is you need to do. Um, if something is going wrong, um, you can just sort of barf, and instead of getting a stack trace, you'll get a nice error message. Um, and then you can you know, basically just do whatever it is you need to do. Um, now, you can sort of certainly override the error message. So there's, there's some hooks into the whole kind of life cycle here. If you don't like just one error message, you want to do something a little more sophisticated, you can catch all the unhandled exceptions and do whatever it is you want to do. Um, if you, now, with a command suite application, typically you're doing something a little more grandiose than just you know, processing some data. So here is, a, here, here is the pre and post hooks um, from uh, a command line app I wrote to interact with track, which is a um, wiki bug tracking type of system. And so every subcommand needed access to track in general. So this pre gets executed before the command happens. So you can set up whatever it is you need to set up in your application, and everybody has access to it. Um, you can debate that I shouldn't be using global variables, but that's the code that I got this from. Um, and we're setting up our thing to track, and then um, going on our merry way. So every command has access to that. You can do the same thing with a post hook. You can tear down database connections or whatever it is that makes sense. Um, a few other features. Uh, you can use all of this to generate RDoC documentation. So you can include that um, in your gem, and it's available in the system RDoC, which is nice, and you don't have to write any of that. Um, 
you can also have a configuration file that's user or site specific. So if the user doesn't like the default values you've assigned, or if he wants to specify default values for options, um, he can put it in a config file and just get read automatically. Um, now, if my Google foo had been better a year ago when I wrote this, and um, the commander's author's uh, Google foo was better, I probably would have found commander, which does almost the same thing. Um, the syntax is very similar. I mean, it looks like I completely ripped it off, which I didn't. I unfortunately found out about it a little too late. Um, it, uh, other than the general syntax, it takes a little bit different approach. Um, I, guess, I guess it's more of like a Rails approach, right, where it glues together a lot of different gems that you might need on the command line. They're all available as dependencies, and you can just access them. So anything from Highline, which lets you interact with the user, getting input and output, um, ASCII tables, which draws like nice <coughs> tables, um, or even Growl on the Mac. Like there's a whole bunch of different gems that are just kind of there when you make a commander application, which may be what you want, and you may not want those dependencies. You know, kind of depends. Um, it doesn't have the hooks or config file support, um, but it has been around for quite a while, and it's a pretty, um, you know, pretty pretty mature uh, thing. Um, the last little bit is this thing called Thor which is not really about building a command line app, but it's about running code from the command line, if that makes sense. Um, you basically define tasks in Ruby files, and then you tell Thor to install them into a central repository, and then anywhere else in the system, you can run these tasks um, using the names that you use to install your code, um, which um, is not exactly making a command line app, but it is a very expedient way to make functionality available throughout the system. And uh, it seems pretty cool. Um, so anyway, in summary, the, the whole point of this is that you should approach your command line applications and you should want to make them awesome. You should approach them with the same kind of rigor and uh, professionalism that you would your regular applications because it, it, it's, it's, not, it's not that hard. Ruby provides a lot of ways to make it really easy, so it doesn't take that much effort to kind of bring your app up to the next level. Um, and really, it's all about being selfish, right? It's all about being nice to future you because future you is going to have to deal with this and future you would much rather have a nice application that's helpful and plays well with others and acts first class than, than not. So that's basically everything. Here's a link to all of the gems that I talked about to check out. And uh, that's it. Thanks. I did have a few time for questions if anybody's got anything. You mentioned um, option parser and follow. How does that compare to like GitOp Long, or is it or pretty much the same thing? Um, you know, GitOp is, is like the old school like C and Perl one, right? And it's just a lot more verbose, yeah. and, and, and Option Parser just I'm sure it uses that under the covers. I just found Option Parser just a lot easier to use in GitOp. Um, but of course, GitOp is going to be familiar to anyone who's coming from from Perl or C. So the question is, you might have a flag that's like dash f or dash f foo. Um, and no, I, I, I decided it would just be simpler to separate things completely. Um, that might be something I add later. I just never really needed that. Uh, I noticed in your slide on GLI, you had two um, f flags. So how does it, like, for instance, those two flags probably conflict, right? So yeah, that deal with those kinds of conflicts. <clears throat> Yeah, that was actually a mistake in my code that I noticed um, as I was giving the talk right now. Um, uh, what would happen is that the last thing that used it would win, essentially. So um, in that example, I think it, there would have been a dash dash force flag. That would still be available, but uh, dash f would be expecting an argument. So if you did dash f, it would give you an error. Cool. Colorization. Um, I, I deal with this with like Rails log files. Do you have a method? when for color output to be on and off, or do you only use a uh, switch to turn it on and off? Um, I mostly just use a switch, although um, I, def I think, um, I want to say Git actually knows if its output is going to a file and it, it doesn't do all that stuff. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to do that. I'm sure there's some Unix TTY stuff, but I, I haven't actually looked at that. I think, I mean, uh, so the question is, uh, does 
having the cross-platform mailing app change my opinion using Ruby. Certainly, if I knew ahead of time this absolutely has to work on Windows, um, I, th I think I would much I would I would sub jump to Ruby a lot sooner. And right now, what happens is I need to script something, and I kind of know it's not going to be on Windows. So I vi blot out sh, and I'm like, and eh, this is not going to work out. So I have to kind of catch myself sometimes. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, that, that's why I like to get in the habit of trying to do it always in Ruby, so that I don't have to worry about that. Uh, um, do you have any preferred way for maybe testing mainline applications, or do you? Yeah, do actually, I I, I, cu I cut that out for uh, for time, but the guy that makes cucumber, um, he um, I can't remember what it is, but he makes a a Aruba. So kind of the, Aruba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can use that to do like behavior-driven command line tests. Um, the tests I wrote for GLI, it was really challenging because I had to sort of simulate RV and all that stuff. And um, if I had known about Aruba, it would have made things a little bit easier. How how accurate is that? Like, how accurate is the GLI uh, development, or is it pretty stable? Um, I think it's pretty stable. I've been using it for a lot of things, and I haven't really done a lot of updates. Um, <laughs> uh, recently, there's certainly a lot of features I can add, but um, right now I'm most of the primary user of it. Um, it's, it's being used in show off, and a few other people have worked it, but um, nothing too crazy. So I'm just sort of in a holding pattern until someone uh, has some opinion about what it what it should do beyond what it does. So Jim installed GLI is almost is it grabbing the latest from GitHub? Yeah, I, I keep it up to date, and it's not too too far. I don't think GitHub's ahead of it at all. So. I think if I had found Commander before, I probably would not have written GLI because it took a lot of work to make it right and everything, and uh, that was not the problem I had to solve at that exact time, but I really wanted to solve it. Um, and Commander is, is pretty nice. I mean, I think in retrospect, Commander has a pretty heavy dependency tree, and so um, where I work now, I, I set up an application. Um, the application that motivated my whole story about someone getting hired to do their job, this actually happened, someone was hired and they started running my application, I didn't realize it. So I, um, I updated it to be a little bit nicer, and then the sysadmins were like, dude, what is this Ruby gem thing I've got to install? And so like, that was kind of a problem. And I didn't have a lot of dependencies, so they ended up doing some crazy thing where you can wrap a gem for a CentOS install package or something. Um, and I was like, wow, if I had like 20 dependencies, this would have been kind of a pain. Um, so I think it's nice to have the option of not having some I think that's what this thing, this this thing, our system in was trying to do. It would basically figure out the gems and put them all together into one thing, and it used YAM. And I, I'm not super familiar with it, but mostly I've just used gem because that, you know, I've had control of the system, so it's pretty easy. So. Yeah. Cool. Anybody? Uh, anything else? All right. Great. Well, thanks a lot.